Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your, um, your syllabus tonight, and welcome those who are listening by Facebook tonight. God bless you. Um, we want to just give a shout out to our sister Linda out there in Maine and Sajeev in India. He's faithful. He watches all the time, you know. And how you doing, brother? My son, how are you? God bless you. We love you. And um, so they've been listening and getting blessed. And, and so uh, praise God. Last week we talked about the, we left off with the qualifications, I believe of an interpreter we talked about uh, the, the interpreter must be born again uh, uh, born of the spirit we talked about the interpreter must have a passionate hunger for the word of God we talked about the interpreter must possess an attitude of humility and I believe we got to these other ones did we get to the interpreter must possess an attitude of reverence we didn't get to that one okay well we'll start with the um, the importance of uh, possessing an attitude of reverence and respect for the word of God now, I'm going to say something, but some people call it legalistic, but I don't believe it is. Uh, I don't like to see the Word of God on the floor. Okay. I believe it, it's, it's more than just a book. I believe it's more than just a history. I believe we should treat it with reverence and respect. Uh, not that we're going to bow down and, and worship it. We're not going to do that, but we need to respect it. And when you respect it, I believe God honors that. Amen? Yeah, they don't put the, uh, Vicky says, they don't put their cell phones on the floor, you know. Yeah, okay, that's better. Yeah, that's right. So next time, next time when you forget your Bible on the way to church, go back home and get it because you do it for your phone. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay. Have a reverence and possess uh, a reverence and a respect for God's word. In Psalm 119, verse 6, it says this, Thou shall, Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. When we respect God's word, when we hold it in high esteem, you won't bring it down to the humanistic secular levels of the philosophies and ideologies of man. Always remember that. Never bring God's standard down. Always bring your standard up to where God's word is. Amen? You never want to bring the standard of God down. And what I mean by that is you, you, don't, you don't want to say, well, you know, God's word says, you know, to, um, to, um, to not commit fornication or not to be married to an unbeliever. But it's okay for me. That means you bring the standard of God down to your understanding and your level. And you can't do that. The moment you begin doing that is when the enemy will come in like a flood with a spirit of error and will begin to teach you things that are not true. I think I gave this, uh, uh, I gave this uh, illustration one time. A woman in a church, this is a true story too, by the way, she, she went to the pastor, and because the pastor shared this with me, I know this was years after she had left the church and everything, didn't tell me her name. But he said, this lady came to me and, and wanted pastoral counseling, and, and wasn't really pastoral counseling. She just wanted to tell the pastor what she was going to do. Okay? And she said, the Lord told me to divorce my husband and marry this other girl. And he said, well, do you have scriptural grounds for it? And she said, yes, the Bible says he taketh away the first to establish the second. Now, the Bible does say that, but it's talking about covenants. It's not talking about marriage. So you can make the Bible say anything you want to make it say. All you have to do is twist the scripture. All you've got to do is misinterpret the scripture, put a meaning into the scripture, and not take a meaning out of the scripture. And that's just one way. But we should always respect God's word. Amen? What's, what's, one of the, what's one of the other ways that we can respect God's word? By obeying it, yes. By obeying it. But also, living a life that's not a, a life of hypocrisy. In other words, you speak one way in church and you go home and you live a different way and, and people look at you and go, wait a minute, you go to church? and How do, how, how do you respect the word of God? You know, David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so that there, either we believe this is the word of God, and this is alive and it's active and it's real, 
or it's not. And I was sharing, I was sharing a little bit about, with that about Bob Lewis today and the other day. I would say, you know, brother, God's with you. Either you believe that or you don't. Because we're never alone, no matter how lonely we feel. See, that's why we can't go by feelings. Nothing more than feelings. You can't go by feelings. You've got to go by faith. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? So uh, praise God. Hallelujah. Fifthly, the interpreter must keep, uh, must accept the total inspiration of the scriptures. Now, there are some people, believe this or not, this is true. There are some people that say, uh, well, I don't really believe the Apostle Paul was inspired. I only believe the words in red that Jesus said. There are actual people that read the Bible like that. They only believe what Jesus said. They don't believe what Paul said. And there are those today who believe only what Paul said. And they don't take what Jesus said because, well, he was speaking just to the Jews. Well, in the context of certain scriptures, he was, but... We can take application and apply those things to our lives and those principles, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We can take those things and apply it to our life. So we must uh, accept the total inspiration of the Scriptures. Even when the government comes and says something totally contrary, we cannot compromise it simply because the government says so. The Bible says... The Bible says that marriage is between a man and a woman, okay? It's not between two hairy dudes, okay? No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way, okay? Uh, so, again, we have to hold the Word of God far above any secular or governmental edict of law. It has to be above that. That's why we can go into anywhere and preach the gospel in the world. Now, we can't go on private property, but we can go on public property, and we can speak the word of God. We can go into cities and towns and speak the word of God. You may get arrested, but you know what? You have, you have divine authority. And Paul says, I think it was Paul or Peter, they, they said, better for us to obey God than to man. Amen. It's better for you to obey God than man. So holding that reverence of God's word and holding the inspiration of God's word is a must. In 2 Timothy 3.16, the interpreter must also accept the total inspiration of the scriptures. All scripture is given by... Come on. 2 Timothy 3.16, it's in your book right there. All scripture is given by... Inspiration of God. All scripture. Say it with me. All. So if someone tells you we don't need the Old Testament anymore, we're not under the Old Testament anymore, they don't know their Bible. In fact, when this scripture was written, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. There was no canonized New Testament yet. So people that say that don't know what they're talking about. In 2 Peter 1.21, it says, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh, I get excited about that. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You, are, you, you have an inspired word of God that is given to you by the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Just, just think about that. The third person of the, of the triune God, the Holy Spirit person, has spoken through men, and they wrote this Bible, and you have it today. You know how, how blessed we are to have the Word of God? Some of us have three, four, five, six copies in our home. I met a, a, a Vietnamese man who was in prison for seven years. And um, he told us, uh, I, don't, I think it was him that told the story. Was it him that told the story about how uh, he had a Bible and the, common day, the, common, uh, the commander of the prison camp took it from him? No, not th no, it's not this one, but it's another one. 
where um, when he had to go to the bathroom every day, the commander would give him a piece of the new, uh, the Bible, would rip it out and tell him he'd have to wipe himself with the with the Bible. And what he did was he began to he began to realize what it was, and he and he and he he took it. And after he did that, he would clean it all off, and he would wash it, and then he would hide it and he would protect it. And he said, "That's how I got through by reading God's Word." And uh, and uh, he said, uh, many many times when he was down, he would take that little piece of paper, as soiled as it was, and he would read God's Word. And he said, "I, I fell so in love with God's Word." I mean, think about that. And here we have it, right here, all of it, not just a piece of it, but all of it, to inspire you and me every day when we neglect it so much. The interpreter must approach the word of God in true faith. In Hebrews 11.3, it tells us that through faith, we understand. Through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Do not believe for one moment the uh, explanation of the, um, the Big Bang Theory. Or scientists say everything evolved. By faith we understand. It's by faith we understand. It's not by reason. It's not by intellectual deduction. It's not through scientific proven method. But by through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. How do we know that? Because in Colossians it says that all things were, he was in the world and he created the world. All things were created by him and through him and nothing that was created was ever made without him. Hallelujah. The word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Praise God. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Think about that. It wasn't the big bang and everything came into a little dot. It says all the things were as seen were not made of things which do appear. God spoke it into existence. It didn't exist, and God spoke it into existence. Isn't that neat? Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Reason alone cannot perceive and grasp the divine com communication. It is unfortunately possible to have eyes and not see, ears and not hear, and a heart and yet not perceive. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 to 17. We'll talk about that for a moment. Matthew 13, 10 to 17. And the disciples came to him, said unto him, Why speakest thou unto, uh, unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. Now look at that word, to them it's not given. Go back for a minute, please. Thank you. But to them it's not given. Whatever revelation or inspiration or illumination, and we're going to be talking about those three things, whatever you get, it's been given to you. Think about it. Why didn't you just wake up one day and say, hey, i got to be born again? Why didn't you get saved? Way back when? Because it wasn't revealed to you. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. When you heard the word of God, when you heard about being born again, when you heard about that you needed to repent of your sins, and you could receive Christ as Savior, when you heard those things that initiated something in you, and God revealed it to you. He gave it to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. The interpreter needs to have a renewed mind. And I'm only going to give you a surface of this because if we go over detail by detail in every single one of these things, we'll be here for five years, ten years. Okay? 
That's why you have the syllabus. You can go in. You can study this on your own. You can look at it. You can look up some of the things maybe we, we overlooked. But it's, it's great to do that. The interpreter needs a renewed mind. Romans 12, uh, I don't like to just quote verse 2, so I like to quote verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, in other words, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Now think about this for a minute. This is almost like a, a paradox. I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, he said, I beg you, you know, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A sacrifice is not living. Sacrifice you kill. You shed the blood of that sacrifice, and you offer it on the altar up to God. How can that be a living sacrifice? How do we interpret that? A living sacrifice. Huh? Yes. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. A living sacrifice. That you're living, but you're not living your life for yourself. You're allowing the life of Christ to live through you. And that's a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God. That's acceptable to God. That's why God doesn't receive stuff done in the flesh. When I say in the flesh, I mean the old carnal nature. I'll give you an example. God calls you and wants you to go to Indonesia, be a missionary. And you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open up a business, and I'm going to support 50 missionaries to Indonesia. God don't accept that. The reason why God doesn't accept that is because you're telling God what you're going to do versus you doing what God told you to do. He told you to go to Indonesia. <laughs> okay. But we bargain with God like that, and we make, we make deals, if you will, with God. You can't make a deal with God, okay? Uh, you're not the deal maker. God is the one that instructs us what we should do, which is your reasonable what? You know what that word service means? It means worship. If you go back in the Greek, you'll see it says, which is your reasonable worship. What's your reasonable worship? Being a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. See, people think worship is just coming into church and, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm just raising my hands and thank you, Jesus. They think that's worship. That's part of, that's an expression, if you will, or that's an outward manifestation of what you are. Your life, a living sacrifice, is supposed to be your reasonable worship. A lot deeper that way, isn't it? When you think of it. And the interpreter needs to depend upon the Holy Spirit's illumination. It's important that you receive the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Don't leave the Holy Spirit out of your study. What's one of the reasons why we should not leave the Holy Spirit out of the studying of the Bible? Because he'll lead us into all truth? What else? What's that? Okay. Did you say something? I heard you say something. Was it something about revelation? Okay. What, 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 how can I put this? What, 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 what? Yes, Darren. He bears witness with his word, yeah. What better person would you want next to you that, to interpret something that he wrote? He's the author. 
Okay. He is the author. I mean, if you're, if you're reading a book, you go, man, I wish I could meet the author and I could really talk to this author. You know what I mean? He, he knows what this whole storyline is all about. Well, the Holy Spirit knows all the storyline. He wrote it. He inspired men to write it. He knows. And he's the only one alive because all of the writers of the, of the Bible are dead now. We can assume that and believe that, right? I mean, they're alive spiritually somewhere in heaven, but, you know, but like John and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul and Peter and all those, James, John, all of them, Isaiah and all that, they all died. They're, they're not here on earth anymore. But the Holy Spirit is. Bring him into your study and test the Spirit to always make sure that it's God. Amen? First Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 to 16. He says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Sometimes we read these scriptures way too fast. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world Unto our glory. Next verse. We're going to go 7 to 16. Which none of the princes of this world knew. He was there. Jesus was there. Okay. But they didn't know it. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Jews... We're waiting for their Messiah, longing for the Messiah to come. And he was right there. Come on. He was right there. He, he walked on their streets. He taught in their temples. He was there. And they didn't know it. Why? Why could they not see that he was the Messiah? Why would they not receive him? Who's got the answer? Somebody here has got to have the answer. Huh? That's right. The Holy Spirit didn't reveal it to them. But why didn't the Holy Spirit reveal it to them? Why were they spiritually blind? See, this is what's good about when you start to interpret the Bible. You ask these questions. Be inquisitive. Why were they blind? They didn't believe. No. No. That well that's true but that's not the reason. Yeah, somebody has said that. Yeah. That's true. No, my wife she's going to probably get this. No, that's the reason. Of why they, that's what it says is that had they known it, they would not have crucified him. No, 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 no. You'll get it in a moment. That's one of the reasons, but it's not the main reason. <laughs> Leisha, why were these princesses? Why were the Jews, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the very Jews that had the Messiah right in front of them, they, they, they were crying out for Messiah. They wanted, were long for the Messiah hundreds of years, huh? Because of the law? No.
Okay, yeah, no. Well, I'm not going to take too much more time. I'll tell you what it is. Or maybe I'll tell you next week. No, no, I'll tell you what it is. Well, you're going to get blessed by this, okay, because of you. Blindness happened to the Israelites so that you could be grafted in. <laughs> but do you see how special that is? And yes, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But you and I and the Gentile world was the main reason why God blinded their eyes that they would not see so that we could be grafted in. Thank you. That's what it should do. It costs thank you and, you know, uh, uh, appreciation. So um, we need to uh, depend upon the Holy Spirit's illumination. And go to the next verse. Let's go all the way to 16. For if they would have known it, they would crucify the Lord of glory. Okay, next, next one. Jesse? Yeah, yeah, right here. We're going to go to 16. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So, see, there are things that you cannot, you cannot see or ear, you can't hear or can enter even in your heart, the things that God has prepared for you for living this Christian life for sacrificing, for being a living sacrifice, for giving up your life so that Christ can live in you. To die daily to yourself and the things that you want and the things of the flesh, to die daily to those things, there's a reward that has not entered your, your ears or you have seen or has entered into your heart the things that God has prepared for you that love him. Next verse. But God hath revealed them Unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Stop for one moment right there. God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. And there are certain things that he reveals and there are certain things he doesn't reveal. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Sometimes the most precious jewels are way down deep, and you've got to dig for them, like the pearl of great price. You've got to dig for that. You, if you really want some spiritual truth, and sp you've got to dig deep for it and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you, like I shared with you, the reason why. We had so many reasons why, and they were, they were good. But the main reason is blindness happened to, to, to them so that we could be grafted in. And that only comes through illumin illumination. That only comes through, wow, God, yeah. Why, why did they, why were they blind? Asking these questions. And when you ask these questions, it'd be, it's, as you study the word, it's revealed more and more to you. And you go, wow, I never saw that. Wow, that's cool. You know what I'm talking about? How many know what I'm talking about? You start to see things. Not, not make-up things, okay? not hallucinatory things, but you begin to see things. Wow, now I understand. Okay, so the interpreter needs to depend upon the Holy Spirit's illumin uh, illumination. The interpreter must recognize there is a theological difference between three things. Number one, revelation. Number two, inspiration. And three, illumination. There's a difference. There's a difference between those three. Uh, I was going to read the rest of the scriptures, but we're running out of time, so I don't want to... Uh, I just want to touch on these three things. <clears throat> so let's look at these three things. Revelation. What is revelation? Revelation is imparted truth, which could not be discovered by natural reasoning. How many have read the scripture? The natural man cannot understand the things which are spiritual, for they are spiritually discerned, neither can he know them. You might know people that are very religious. You might know people that go to church. 
And you can tell them about Scripture, and they can talk to you about Scripture, but they haven't got a clue who Jesus is. They're religious. They have a head knowledge. And uh, there was a, a gospel track years ago written called Missing Heaven by 18 Inches. And you know the, that what it was talking about was that, the, that your brain is 18 inches from your heart, exactly. A lot of people have knowledge, but they don't have the heart experience. They don't have the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. They're not born again. They're just religious. They, know, they read the Bible. They get the history. They know terminology. They know what to say. They know he was born in Bethlehem. They know he, he rose from the dead. They know all of these physical manifestations and things, but spiritually they don't know about him. They're blinded. How many, how many have ever run into people like that? You've run into people that are religious. Okay, they think they're saved. They think that their good works are going to get them to heaven. Okay? But that's not true. They're not going to go to heaven. Good works can't get you into heaven. If that's the case, that nullifies the blood of Jesus. Revelation is imparted truth which could not be discovered by natural reasoning. The Bible was written by the revelation of God. In it, God had revealed himself. That is, his nature, his character, and his being. All that may be known of God in this life is founded in and upon the scriptures. They are the only inspired and fallible authority for all Christians of faith and practice. We got people today that are saying God is a she. What do you say to that? There are those who say that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, well, those are just names. They're not, they're not people. They're not person. They're not a person. They're, they're, just, an, uh, 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 they're just a name. Like a, a man can be a husband. He can be a father. You know, he can, he can be a son. Just a name. No. The Bible is very clear on those things. Very clear on Revelation. The Bible is the only inspired authority in your life. So if all of a sudden uh, you're home and you're praying and you're worshiping God, I'm trying to think of the story I heard a missionary was telling one time. He was in prison. I must have read it somewhere. He was in prison, and he was, and he was rejoicing in the Lord. He was worshiping the Lord. He said, and all of a sudden, this light sh shined right into his jail cell. Powerful, powerful. He said it was blinding. And then he saw this figure appear to him. And the figure spoke to him. And he said the figure was all in white. And he said the figure spoke to him and said, fall down and worship me. Bow down and worship me. And he said, there was such a, a presence of peace and there was such a, a presence of this light that just om almost penetrated through you. And he said, he was just about ready to bow his knee. And he said, let me see the nail prints in your hands. And the thing disappeared. But how many would have said, that's Jesus. Can I tell you, there are People on television will tell you they went up to heaven or Jesus came down and they were in their room and Jesus sat on the edge of the bed with them and put his arm around him. That's not Jesus. Jesus is seated, seated at the right hand of the Father and he's not coming back to earth until he comes back with all of his glory, with all of his saints. The second time as you have seen this Jesus go up into heaven, the angel said, the same Jesus you see go is coming in the same land. When he comes back to the earth, he's coming to the Mount of Olives. All that may be known of God in this life is founded in and upon the scriptures. And they are the only inspired and infallible authority for all Christian faith and practice. Always remember that. 
whatever practice of, of your faith, whatever you want to know about God, if somebody comes and writes a book apart from God's word and says, you know, God is no longer wrath. God is all love. Is that true? See, the problem with people today is they dissect God. Okay? They separate holiness, righteousness, and they just say God is love. And so everything's... See, everything with, with the type of love they're thinking about, okay, is that God is love and he accepts everyone and anything. It doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want, be whatever you want, violate his word, violate his statutes, and it's, it's okay. God still is, God's going to love you and it's going to be okay. You're going to be accepted. You, everyone's going to heaven. No one's going to go to hell. Everyone's going to die and go to heaven because God is love. That's not true. How do we know it's not true? Come on, shout it out. Because the word of God says differently. It says in Revelation that God's wrath is going to be poured out upon the earth. Well, how can he be a God of love if he's pouring out his wrath? His justice. He's righteous. And he's going to judge. Let me ask you a question. I'm just going to digress for a moment. <clears throat> I'm going to pick on Eddie. Eddie's got two daughters, right? Eddie comes home one night. His two daughters are in the apartment, laying on the floor in a pool of blood, brutally raped and stabbed to death. What the perpetrators didn't know is that he had a video because he works in video. And he set up his house with a video surveillance. So the police come. He gives them the video. They've got identification of who did it. So now they're in a courtroom. There's a judge. And the judge looks at all the evidence and says, Now, Eddie, I know you've been through a horrible experience. But you know what? We've got to forgive. We've got to love. And so I'm going to let them, the ones that killed your daughters go. How would you feel? You want justice. Well, it's the same with God. We can't keep spitting in his face. We can't keep turning our back on him. We can't keep neglecting him because he is the righteous judge. And we can't do those things and expect God's just going to say, oh, it's okay, unless you repent. Once you repent, then you're stamped not guilty. Your verdict is in. Hallelujah. You're not guilty, and you will go to heaven. Praise God. So we have revelation, which is imparted truth. Then we have inspiration, which is described by the process by which the revelation was recorded. And, it's by, and it says here, the scriptures are the infallible revelation because of the inspiration of God. And we said that about 2 Timothy 3.16. And then you have illumination. And what illumination is, the perception of truth brought about by the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Luke 24, verse 13. You know the story here. Jesus is, has just been resurrected from the dead. There's turmoil in Jerusalem. You can imagine the emotions and the feelings of the disciples seeing the one who was promising so many things die on a cross at the hands of the Romans. 
not really sure if they'd ever see him again. And it says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. <clears throat> Anybody know how, how long three score furlongs are? Huh? It's in your Bible, cheater. What does your Bible say? Seven miles? Yeah, it's about seven miles. Oh. Let me let me get there. I wrote it down. Yeah, it's about six point eight miles. Anybody know what a three score is? What's one score? Why are you saying Leisha? <laughs> no. A score is 20, so three score is 60. A furlong, a furlong is about, oh, let's see, a furlong is about 606 feet, 9 inches. So when you multiply it out, it's between 6.8 to 7 miles. That's, see, but that's good information to know. That's good information to know. They, they had quite a walk on their hands. Okay, and if you've been into if you've been to Israel and you know the roads there before they're fixed like they are today and paved, there's a lot of rocks, a lot of rocks. Verse fourteen. And they talk together of all these things which had happened. They're going over what took place in Jerusalem. You know, Jesus was there and he suffered and he died on the cross and everything that took place. You know, next. And it came to pass that while they were communed together and they reasoned, they were trying to figure it all out. There, were t there was dialogue between the both of them. They were walking along and they're talking and they're saying, you know, what, what's going to happen next? What, you know, I don't understand everything that's taking place. You know, why did this have to happen? He was the Messiah and we recognize him as the Messiah. Why did he have to die? You know, what, what's the story here? And understand, you know, it's easy for us to, to criticize and say, well, well, how come they didn't know? We have the Bible. They didn't have that. It wasn't canonized yet. Okay, so they only uh, they only had copies of the Old Testament, and they were kept in a temple. Not everybody kept an Old Testament under their arm. Okay, so they were reasoned with each other. They were communing with each other, and Jesus Himself drew near to them and went with them. Next verse, please. But their eyes were holden that they should not know Him. In other words, the revelation or the illumination was not given to them of who he was. They had eyes to see, but they couldn't see spiritually. Some people can't see spiritually. Okay? God wants you to see spiritually. And he said to them, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and you're sad? What's, what's going on, you know? And one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answering, said to him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which have come to pass that there in these days? I mean, where you been? You've been on another planet somewhere? You've been watching CNN or something? And he said to them, what things? Now understand, it was Jesus. <laughs> he knew what things they were. And a lot of times he'll ask a question, not even though he knows the answer, because he wants to see our response. And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. They're talking to him. He's right there. But their eyes could not see him. 
That's why you have to go beyond the natural to the spiritual. He says, have you not heard about concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people? Did you hear that? And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him? Well, that throws John Hagee's book out the window. Because they said, he said that the Jews were not responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. But we trusted that it had been that he should have redeemed Israel. I mean, we had hoped that this was the Messiah, that he was going to redeem Israel. We were going to get out of the hands of those stinking Romans and their tyranny and their slavery and their rule over us. And beside all this today is the third day since these things were done. They were actually walking in the very day of resurrection. Yea, and certain women also of our company were astonished, and which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that he had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken. Look at that. Slow of heart to believe that which was written already. That which was written already. Ought not Christ, Messiah, to had suffered these things to enter into his glory? Now, Jesus then, what he did was he turned on their spiritual lights, right? He, he just revealed it was a supernatural, spiritual thing, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. He didn't have a, they didn't have a spiritual experience. Ooh. What did Jesus do? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he what? expounded that's what we're doing tonight we're going to learn how to expound the word of god he expounded unto them all and all the scriptures the things concerning himself come on somebody let's let's read that again and beginning at moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them all and all the scriptures the things concerning himself all of the prophecies all of the teachings, all of the predict predictions. You read in the Old Testament, the prophets prophesied where he'd be born. He would, he would be called a Nazarene. Come on. All of those things he began to expound and show them concerning himself. That was awesome. So these three things, revelation is truth given, inspiration is truth recorded, which is the Bible, and illumination is truth received. The, spirit, the interpreter also needs to maintain a spirit and attitude of prayer. You know what God loves to hear? What three, what three words does God love to hear from us? I love you. No. <laughs> no, that's much. You know, I love you, God. No, no, no. Lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Leisha, do you know? Do you love me? 
Oh, you know I love you, Lord. There's three kinds of love. There's a love that's fond of God. They're just fond of him. You know, they, they like him. Then there's an eros love, which is the erotic love. But then there's agape love. When Jesus asked Peter, he didn't ask him phileo love, friendship love, or eros love. He said, Peter, do you agape me? That's unconditional love. Are you going to love me, Jeanette? Are you going to love me even if you're in prison? Even if you suffer for my name's sake? Are you going to agape me, Peter? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. And he responded, phileo love. He didn't respond back to Jesus in agape love. Look at the, that's why I tell you, get that Strong's Concordance, because you can look up the words are different. They're not the same. And it brings out so much more depth of meaning when he says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I'm, a, I'm fond of you. That's not what Jesus asked him. He asked him a second time, Peter, do you agape me? And then Peter says, you know, Lord, that I phileo you. Jesus asked him a third time, and Peter got upset, and he says, Lord, you know all things. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. The interpreter needs to maintain a spirit and attitude of prayer. The interpreter needs to maintain, meditate on the word. Psalm 1, verse 2. Psalm 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Hmm. We delight in ESPN. Come on. We delight in sports. We, we, come on. We'll sit there and watch three hours of a sport, whether it's football, baseball, soccer, basketball, whatever it is. How much time do we do on this? I delight, but his delight is in the law of God, and his law does he meditate day and night. That's why people in third countries, you know, third world countries that don't have what we have, a lot of the sidetracks and all that stuff, they know the word. They believe the word. Because they don't have all the other stuff to, to take their attention away from things. You know, not that it's wrong to do some things. It, it, it's okay to do those things, but be in proper perspective. You know, it's like you want to go to a ball game once in a while, go ahead. But to go to every single ball game of the Red Sox and, you know, and then say to God, oh, I don't have time to study your word. Well, that's a problem. The interpreter needs to meditate on the word, and the interpreter must be intellectually honest. Oh, the three words God likes to hear. I don't want to forget that. You know what they are? I don't know. You can go to God and tell him, say, you know what? I don't know. Please show me. i never forget the time. Wow, it's 25 past 8 already? Oh, man. I'm sorry. Well, I can't finish because it will take too long. But I'll finish with this. I'll never forget the time I was home. And I was reading Romans. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to stay in Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I believe it was over a year. I would sit in my rocking chair. And he had me write out these words and put on the side of my refrigerator, the flesh must die. I said, Lord, what are you what are you trying to say? And I begin to study Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. 
And for the first time, I, I saw the revelation of what took place on the cross besides my salvation, Jesus saving my soul, about my old man being crucified with him, that I can live in newness of life. And I just started meditating on that word and meditating. I got that long before um, Jimmy Swaggart got it. Jimmy Swaggart got it, and he got all excited about it. Like he, was, he, was the first, he wasn't the first one, and I wasn't the first one either. Okay? Brother Clendenin was one of the first ones to see the, the truth of the revelation of the cross, that through dying, when you die, you gain. When you lose your life, you find it. It's not like what we think. We try to save our life. We, we try to, you know, savor our life. We try to feed our life. But God's ways are just the opposite, is that when we truly die to self, that's when we live. When we truly are willing to sacrifice is when we truly see the gain. It's through sacrifice. Amen? So keep on reading. Keep on learning. Seek the Lord about interpreting the Bible. Say those three words, I don't know. It's okay. You don't have to feel intimidated with God. You're not in a contest with God because you'll never know more than him. Okay? He knows everything. And so that's the great thing about God is that he knows everything. And if he knows everything, you just go to him and say, Papa, I don't know. What am I supposed to do? I don't know, God. Show me what to do. The Bible says he will lead and guide you, right? Lord, I don't understand this. What does this mean? I, I, can't, I can't grasp this. What, wait, what are you talking about here? Show me every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. What does that mean? Show me, Lord. He is the vine, we are the branches. Show me what that means, Lord. I did that one time. I, I took a branch, and I used it as a sermon illustration. I might have preached it here before. I had a stick about this long. Actually, I was preaching about um, the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. How many know what was inside the ark? Yeah. Ten Commandments. What else? Mm, nope, you're close, but not, not quite. Aaron's rod. What else? A pot of manna. Okay. And so I had I had this, this stick about this big, and I, I said, I want you to describe to me this stick. What do you see? People said, nothing. <clears throat> there's no fruit. There's no leaves. No, it's dead. So when you see people say I'm analytical, and I can be, but it's a good thing. Because I look at something like that and go, okay, why is it dead? Why was that stick dead? Why was that piece of wood dead? Because it was disconnected from its life source. Okay. But check this out now, okay? When, the, when they put the Aaron's rod into the Ark of the Covenant, along with the part of manna and the Ten Commandments, why did they do that? Because they didn't want to lose it? No. Why did they do that? Well, the part of manna was showing the supernatural provision of God that even in a place of a wilderness where there is no food, God can supply. Okay. The word of God is, is there forever. The word of God is alive. It's quick and powerful. Right? But what about the, the rod? Well, remember there was a big distinction between the, the, uh, the heads of families of who was going to be in leadership. And so, they, so Moses said, take a rod, right, the name of the leader of the, every family, and we're going we're gonna to put it in, 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 the, in the ark. And the one that has almonds and blossoms is going to be the one that I'm going to choose. So when they went into the ark after a while, they, they took it out. It was Aaron's rod that budded, right? So Aaron was chosen. But here's the thing. The rod was, was, was 
cut off from its natural sources. But it still budded. It was still fruitful. There was fruit on it, and there was buds on that rod that was cut off from its natural life source, which means that in the presence of God, this life that will bring spiritual fruit. See, even though you cut your life off from this world, even though you cut yourself off from this the source of life here, in the presence of God, you have more fruit to bear. You're like Aaron's rod. You'll be fruitful and you'll, be, you'll blossom and you'll, you'll be productive, even when you, when you cut off that very life source. Now, you don't get that by simply just reading the Bible. You have to sit. You have to meditate. You have to think. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Wow. Think about that. I get excited about that stuff. You know what I mean? And he told me, go out and get a stick. And I went out and got a stick, and I'm looking at the stick, and he's trying to teach me these lessons. Always remember, God uses the practical sometimes to bring spiritual lessons. Jesus did it all the time. Read the parables. The kingdom of God is like a man that uses natural things to bring a spiritual principle. And so don't lose that when you're reading God's word. Don't just read God's word as a historical book or a book of factual information, but it's alive. It's real, you know. It's like, wow, look how God chose leadership. It wasn't according to their degrees and their abilities. It was according to their, their being fruitful in his presence. That if you spend time in God's presence, your life will be fruitful. Isn't that cool? Amen. Father, we thank you for tonight. We ask that your blessing be upon us. God, help us to move along in the study. Lord, because it's so easy to get bogged down with so many things because, Lord, it, the lights just go off. I see little light bulbs above, above everybody's heads tonight. Lord, wanting to see more of you through the scriptures. And, Lord, we just pray that you would help us to get through this study, Father, and to, to learn how to interpret and, and know about revelation and, and inspiration and illumination. Father, we thank you and praise you for tonight. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen.